Cool. I so what's that. this? So basically, oh, okay, you, you want to start, Shankar? Sure, why not? Let's start with the reminder. The whole AMA session is going to be recorded. So, howdy and welcome everyone to the AMA session with Frank O'Collins, a well-known law researcher, and Ramsey, one of the contributor and council member at HVR, representing as engineer from Decentration. So, on the behalf of the whole community, Welcome, Frank and Ramsey. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thanks for, thanks for coming, everyone. Just um, So this is basically a warm-up uh, slash AMA, which is um, hopefully going to be the preamble for our ongoing discussions, which are going to mm -hmm. be uh, as seminars, uh, which are likely going to be on a platform that uh, creates more shareable content uh, and amplified across various crypto communities. And um, um, shall I, I'll, I'll quickly introduce Frank very briefly, um, uh, if that's Please. okay with you, Frank. And so, you, yeah, yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, so f f as, you, as you mentioned there, Frank, uh, um, Sh Shankar, Frank is a, a law researcher and systems architect. Um, I've came across his work five years ago and learned uh, a a, a, a paradigm shifting amount of 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 understanding about law uh, and competence um, of law, and I thought it would be great for the the current discussions in uh, in crypto right now related to jurisdictions, law, what it what what actually is it we're building here other than decentralized networks? How has that got relevance to the physical world, what kind of futures, what kind of future are we going to create? Um, and what will it take essentially to um, build robust enough systems that have uh, any sort of relevance or authority in, in the real world? So, um, um, and, and so Frank essentially has um, got plenty uh, years experience uh, in this, in, des in um, building and uh, working on um, creating replacement frameworks and systems um, in law. Hopefully he can share us his uh, knowledge, uh, experience and wisdom in understanding the principles of law. So we have, we are more informed essentially in um, moving forward and, and um, designing systems with, with consciously um, and perhaps uh, much less guessing, and hopefully can reduce the time frame for us in in um, uh, you know getting in getting to where we want to go. Essentially, so is that okay for an introduction, Frank? Yeah, no, good, was good. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I appreciate it. Um, and so, how do you want to do this? Do you want to like intro? Do you want to do like a yeah, yeah, I'd like to do a little, a little intro, and then I then I really want to kind of explore with the with everyone on here. Um, is there a, is there a, a like a, a an associated um, text that people can write questions in, and would that be able to be flicked across? So, could yes, you yes. flick them across? Could you flick them across to me in Skype um, as they come on, and then I, what I can do is is pick them up. So, if people have questions, please. Um, chuck them in the room, and if Ramsey can pick them up, put them back, I can see them and, and talk. I just wanted to start, and I don't want this to, at all to be, I want this to be collaborative, and the whole idea of this is, is to engage with everyone who wants to engage, or if you want to listen, that's great, on, on the call, to get as much out of this as, as you like. But I think given um, the intro to me talking tonight, some of the back and forth that um, I was shown, although I didn't really get into the, 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 the stuff that was going on. I think it's important that I cover two things first that I think will be really important and helpful. The first is the idea of where I'm coming from and the kind of background that happens when you are trading ideas on the internet um, and essentially the, the consequences of uh, trying to, you know, fly on the internet um, 
it, it makes for entertaining reading and it, and it leaves a trail sometimes bloody. Um, but it's, 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 I guess, a history. And after doing this for a long time, the first websites of Ducadia were actually in 1999. So it's been around for a while. Um, you have a history. So you'll find various things. So I want to cover that first just to dispel that. And I'll answer any question on any of the history or anything you find. I have no problems in answering that. The second thing I want to talk about is the understanding of how we get the best out and how we can discuss ideas. Because I think one of the things that's lost is people can come across as being overly defensive or overly offensive. And we lose the sense of the ancient traditions of dialectic and collaboration. And what I, I do want to talk about that at the moment because I think there's a lot to be said about challenging someone and about asking challenging questions, but also making the distinction between things that are directed at a person as opposed to an idea. I have no problems on either, by the way. I have no problems on either. But I think to get the best out of sharing with you what I've learned and that's all I'm really doing is sharing with you what I've learned over doing this for um, over sort of fourth decade. Um, I want you to be able to, to ask whatever you want, and but I want to frame it, if we can, in also learning how to develop the arguments and the skill of arguments and how we can develop that skill. Because I think that's something that is not only useful, I think it's vital. Um, for any future development. You have to be able to have hard discussions. You have to be able to challenge ideas and feel both confident in raising it and in confident in responding. So let me just start, and I don't want to go in and, and say the history of Ukada, where it comes from. I think people can sort of find that, but I do want to sort of cover a few things that I think are important, just, just to kind of give a, a context. Um, firstly, over 30 plus years now of doing this, I can't even count the number of times I've failed. I've come up with an idea, an idea didn't work, a theory didn't work. You rebuild, you reconstitute, you crack on and you try something else. So I didn't fail because I didn't try. Um, it's the complete opposite. I failed because UK has been a constant challenge to develop more and more. And so as a consequence, there's a, there's a history in, in doing that. Um, I know there are some people, although I haven't really met many, that have similarly tried and, and, and failed over several times that have no history <laughs> in doing that. I haven't met one yet, but it seems to be a consequence that if you are trying new ideas and you're trying to develop ideas, that a consequence of that is you build a, a trail. And what the idea has been, if I kind of get to the essence of what Yukata has tried to do, is, is it possible to construct and consider a better model? That's really where it started. It started with the question of why, actually. Yukata started with the question of why are we stuck in these certain paradigms? Why do we keep continuing to do the same thing? Remember, this is before blockchain, before anything. There was nothing on the internet that I could compare it to. There were people that were channeling through. There's always been people trying to challenge parts of the system, and, and law reform has been around for centuries. But there wasn't this idea of, certainly not when the internet first started, what is the architecture and infrastructure of a proper replacement a proper alternative digital universe. Now, I don't just mean the stuff that you hear now with Facebook, which is the kind of the snazzy, sexy bit of people having goggles or in a virtual room and whatever. I, I'm talking about a, a proper society, and a proper society is built on all these layers. It's built on almost always societies are built on their narrative, their story. They're called sacred texts, but for many societies around the world, when, when, even when they have no written language, the narrative, the, the agreed underpinning that kind of connects people to where they are, why they're there, where they come from, who the heroes were, who the villains were, why they are who they are and what gives them their identity, that almost for every 
society is the kernel. That's the, the kernel of their operating system, if I use that as an analogy. So I was looking and saying, well, what's the kernel? You know, have we got the right kernels here? And then uh, we looked into an another element of that. We brought, brought that out further. We said, well, we say we, I mean me. Sorry if I say we. <laughs> there are other, other people who help me, but yeah. Um, law. Law then starts to get built on that. Um, and uh, religious society structures, politics, courts, all that starts to get built on that. So when we talk of a, a digital universe, it's not just computers and infrastructure or blockchain or, or exchanges. It's the full spectrum of what you see in the physical, in the off-chain world, as, as uh, I've learned to, to say. And so I started on that journey. Um, early on, I didn't get much negative feedback because it wasn't <laughs> much out there. I think, don't think people were understood. So up until probably 2012, uh, it was fine. We built up 80 websites and, and laid out frameworks for um, building decentralized networks. I mean, those ideas were up in 2006, you know, years, years before um, anyone ever published their first paper on blockchain. And it started to have an effect. It started to open things up. But what I found, um, and part of the legacy, is sometimes sparking an idea, because we don't know how to argue, the argument was kind of directed personally or things were created around that to kind of um, people challenging ideas before they found their, their way, their voice. And I had to learn too how not to get involved in that because we, we're not taught how to argue. We're not taught how to develop the things that are not um, given to us anymore. Rhetoric is a word that um, you just don't get taught about at school. We don't know how to argue. Um, so UK to start as an idea of how do we build this infrastructure? Um, in 2016, I pulled everything down. And I pulled it down not because um, it wasn't working. Uh, there was well over a million visitors a month across the website. It was doing nicely. A lot of people, people were supporting it. Yes, there was a, a history to it, but but it was going fine. I pulled it down because... The purpose of UK was never about um, success, glory, money, fame, or any of those things. It, it started as a true challenge. Can we build a viable, or two, in fact, better still, can we build a replacement to things that are not working? And can that work in a digital universe? By 2016, there was enough orthodoxy and, and tailwind behind this, that it was making it harder and harder and harder to reinvent and kind of keep the folding and the learning being applied. So one of the big reasons I pulled it down was I, I was that I couldn't keep developing it. Um, in the last seven years, I've refined and last seven years I've built on the technology that we've got. UK has its own monetary unit uh, called UK to Monitor, and it's primary function, apart from anything else, was to recognise every single person that's contributed to Acadia. So whether they contributed in donations or they contributed in time, the purpose of that unit was to recognise the value of that contribution. That's really why I was formed first. Um, the only person that can't hold monitor uh, is me. Um, I'm under the structure of Acadia. Um, I can never hold monitor or own monitor or any assets. And not because I'm, um, well, maybe I'm a crackpot, I don't know, but you know, people invented blockchain with crackpots. Guys who invented electric cars with crackpots. Jet planes get, with crackpots. Frank, can I give it context as well? Because there's probably a lot of people that didn't see the, the yeah. sort of thread uh, on, the, yeah. on the main channel. Like there was, there was uh, shots fired basically last week uh, when I shared Frank's uh, project intro um, from a new a new customer on Edgeware, and it was yeah, below yeah, the belt. It, it, it was below the belt. Yeah, and, no, no, I, I, I use it. I, I'm, I know, and I'm not. Uh, look, I've had I've had worse things. I've been told I'm a failed guru. Any number of things doesn't matter. But I'm just trying to context. But I'm, I was being a bit tongue in cheek there. Um, UK is not for personal profit. 
for my personal profit. It, it, it certainly is a viable system and it certainly has an incredibly rich value, an incredibly valuable source of knowledge in the structure of law and the history of law and how to, to really build off-chain and on-chain structures, whether it be DAOs, meta-DAOs, whether it be complex arrays of them, whether it be dealing with sovereignty, you name it. We can't cover it in one session. We probably can't cover it in a number of sessions. But I've gone longer than I've expected. That's really a, a kind of rough background where I come. Um, I am who I am. You know, I write my own software. Um, the things that you learn along the way, um, as I say, you, you build a history as you do that. Um, and whereas when the first blockchain came on and I felt that people were kind of taking ideas from what I'd done and my ego was a, a, a lot, uh, a, a lot uh, brittler than it is now, <laughs> um, I used to get upset. And, and really, Ramsey and others reached out to me and I acknowledged that blockchain has a history, it has a life, it has a future, um, more than that, it's been doing what I've been doing. It's been learning. It's been trying. It's, and, and so in some cases it's been failing, but it's been succeeding more than it's failed. So it was time for me to kind of respond to that reach out that people have tried over the years and I've said no, to say, you know what, it's time for me to share what I've learned to see if I can help you guys in what you're trying to do. And that's really the purpose of this. It's not for money. It's not for anything. It's, it's to try and ultimately help you. Um, and just share what I know. So that's a long intro, I'm sorry. Um, but really, it's up to the questions people want to ask me. Um, I can approach this anyway. We can talk about specific things. We can talk about broad subjects. We can talk about sovereignty. You can ask me personal questions. If there are things you've read and you go, well, I'm not too sure if this guy is someone we want to hear. I'm open to anything you want to ask me um, to start with. And if no one wants to start up, Rampy, you can kick off with anything. But yeah, I guess I'm I could open. I could kick off. Thanks for thanks for that, Frank, um, and uh, and kind of uh, bringing up the certain ob objections that uh, came up up front there. But um, yeah, so so I guess Eucadia is um, a, a, a solution that you've come up with. But I guess a lot a lot of people don't understand the problem. And so, what, what, what do you? What, okay, well, we talked about this, is a this big question. Um, the other day. Yeah. Well, okay. Here, here's here's the thing to to, to think about. Uh, you've got people building more chains. You've got people building metadata. You've got people trying to stabilize <laughs> stablecoin. You've got all these things, amazing things. And I and I look at it now and see it is incredible. Polka dot, all these amazing things. What is the ultimate universe that these are being built in? You say, well, it's, it's easy. It's digital, you say. Yeah, it's digital. But, but think about what I mean by a universe. What, what is the defined space this is, this is in, uh, ultimately? So what's polka dot? Yes, think further, think further, think further. Don't think Zuckerberg, just think jurisdiction. Think of the structures that are out there. And what you find is that with all the incredible innovation, with all the amazing work, with the literally now millions of people and resources, the universe that this is all being built in could well be caused, called the, the Davosverse, if you want to call it that, or the Wall Streetverse, right? And I'm, I'm no offence to, to people in either of those groups. Um, I'm simply saying, by default, the... The universe that you are all part of, ultimately, is the same on uh, off-chain verse that people are saying is out of date, out of touch, because there hasn't been the infrastructure definition in a proper societal structure, real societal structure, yet established, that clearly delineates the two. Just whacking on sovereign does not make us... <laughs> does not make just the society as an independent sovereign state. Um, a flag doesn't make it. Running a few forms doesn't make it. It, it. There's a history of society and principles of society 
regardless of law of nations or any of the philosophies that go with it, that really date back to the beginning of civilization. So at the moment, none of those things have been tackled. So I guess that's a, that's a good question to start with when we think, well, this guy's talking about this stuff that's out there and we're, we're focused on our tokens and these practical things, and he seems a bit kind of off. But if you're building into a society structure, an overall universe by default, that is already the IMF, the, the IRS, the, the US Treasury, the HMRC, you're already under their jurisdiction and you've not proven a single way that you're a different, um, distinct place. What do you think is going to happen at one point? What's going to happen? It's inevitable that regulation is going to come in. It already has. It's inevitable that the question of jurisdiction is lost. It's inevitable that these things will be moulded to the way that societies mould them. It's inevitable because I don't see – there is no distinction yet. It can be, absolutely. It's not too late. But there is zero emphasis in web. web. Yeah? So, anyway, I'm, I was going on and on there. So, look, I, I want – that's just a topic for discussion. So you could say rubbish. There are people doing it. Sorry, who wants to talk then? Go for it. We've got a question absolutely. from Shankar. Okay, Shankar, far away. So thanks, Frank, for the incredibly fascinating intro and detailed background. Um, so I have a question for Ramsey, actually. Ramsey, um, HVAC community members are quite familiar with you already through several AMAs. But would you like to share how you came across Frank and how you develop an interest in law? Okay, that's, that's cool. Yeah, so uh, I, I came across, uh, I was searching the internet, as you do, to learn things. And the question I was asking was to do with law and the courts. Because it was a, you know, I have friends that are barristers, you know, uh, people that work in the court system um, and who are trained in, in a certain way. And I noticed they weren't asking certain questions and like that question was what gives the judge authority and what gives the court authority in in, in the matter that's being dealt with and in my exploration uh i was i i i, I came across various people on, on youtube videos online threads forums and um uh i was point many pointed in the direction of, of of Franco Collins, which um, you know, who was the founder of Eucadia, and who ha he had seminars back in 2013 that a few of you actually here have, uh, have seen and shared shared with others. And I learned a bunch basically about the the, the core principles essentially and um, of um, or, or, and concepts um, of law and what are the sort of building blocks that um uh and how essentially uh, getting a sort of like clear uh, clearer understanding of how um how to navigate these this gr big these big questions of law basically you know because there's uh, millions of statutory laws uh, knocking around and there are um you know, you have to you have to train many years in in schools to become a lawyer. But I wanted to boil it. I wanted to learn and get it distilled into its core principles. And you know, there's a lot of like kind of crossover with blockchain and how um, Bitcoin came was designed. You know, from a first principles approach. You know, not essentially trying to fix the current banking system, but essentially redesigning it. From the foundation and uh, um, you know piloting a a different uh, a different uh, type of system that has better core values and uh, uh, things like that. So yeah, I mean this is how I came across uh, Frank um, back in probably 2015. Uh, I reached out to him 
the first time, I think, in 2017. I mean, if I can tell you this, the rabbit hole that one goes down, I think we need to, we need to unpack these, unpack it a little bit more, uh, Frank. And we could, I think, some hopefully they'll myself and others can ask some questions that can help. Um, oh, I mean, well, I mean, road. I mean, Laurie's he, he's he, he's a he's another one. So I've just given a thought. I I don't want to get stuck too far into whether people know or don't know law, whether they're barristers, solicitors, and, you know, the best barristers will be the first to tell you that in their world, the law is procedure. Now, it's not who knows the law, it's who knows the procedure. I mean, that's how courts work now. So, so a lot of this can come across as kind of harking to the past rather than to the present. Um, but before we get into that, I, I, I want to kind of throw another seed in there because it's good butcher, so we're throwing seeds, yeah, another seed into the community. And it's this idea of how many people even conceive that there is an underlying structure of first principles of law that may not even resemble the contemporary law form and the world you live in, the, the place that you live in at the moment. In other words, are we so kind of trained and experienced in the way that we live life that when they say the law, the rule of law, we accept that there's only one system and that's it. It's what they say and that's it. A good example is you will not find in any book that I've found someone, well, probably find someone finds one, but I haven't found one yet, where you find a definition of civilised rules plenty of them, but then uncivilised rules. That is, what is the principles of civilised law and society? What makes society tick? Yeah, we hear innocent till proven guilty, but what are those fundamentals? And then uncivilised. What are the principles that erode law, that undermine law, that, that essentially are the terminal signs of a society degrading and ultimately collapsing? And you don't find it. So not only do we not think that there is in existence an underlying, independent, pure, ideal structure that can't really be corrupted, that is a theme that travels through every society back to the beginning. You can see it in history, in the Romans and the Greeks. There will be good times, there will be bad times, people will corrupt it, but you can go right back and see it. And can we distinguish the two? Can we see uncivilised principles so that we can objectify this? And that's some of the, the challenge we have in talking about these things. And I think this is why some people kind of default to almost kind of a personal reaction to this, uh, is that can we separate ourselves out and see the fact that there are a lot of things going on in our society and in our structures that may have nothing to do with proper principles of law, but they're presented as law, private law, for example. We live in a public society. We live in a society that tells us that we elect people, we're in a democracy, might be in a republic, you might be in a constitutional monarchy, you might be in any number of different models, but we're told that our systems are public. And in the building of DAOs and communities now, you'll some of the ethos, which I love that you've got this, is this idea of decentralised liquid democracy, these ideas of allowing people to share ideas in exchange and, and, and their, their vote matters. Well, what is private then? If I said to you that, that, that most of the courts are, are operated by people that belong to private societies, they're essentially private businesses in public buildings. You know that. It's a... We talk about law guilds and things. No offence again to people who are in them and judges as opposed to resign from them, but they're still part of the infrastructure. How does that fit with law? So uh, it, I don't want to sort of go down too far in that, but I'm, it's a, another thought okay. is have you Can ever thought that? of that? Hmm. Yeah, yeah, Frank, that's a good – I think that's a great place um, because people – I think people would have like a natural kind of value of private and public and what we're trying to do is kind of build this kind of sort of private, public infrastructure, uh, mm. decentralized 
uh, underpinned by decentralized blockchain frameworks. And so, like, um, I think the, the 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 general understanding, or at least how it's perceived, is that when you the court system in United Kingdom and probably many other countries. Um, when you go there, you feel like you're going into some kind of public office, like the government, like the you know, like 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 the Houses of Parliament in in, in London. Like you're going into this public office, and you know matters are being dealt with in a public sort of way with this uh, with honor and with uh, you know um, and and justice, basically. So how you know? In reality, how how what is the difference there, like between that idea and going into a county court or 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 an employment tribunal um, where there is a judge there? What is the difference between pri- between public and what could potentially be private? And how can we know the difference if we were to interact with that? And I think that might. Well, you, you wouldn't know, and that's the problem. You wouldn't know. So there's the the issue for and, – and actually, I want to clear something up before we dive into this, this idea of centralised ideas and decentralised, because, again, one of the things that people might look at with your cater and say, wow, this is all very centralised and we're kind of against that. We're kind of into making it all free. And I want to make the distinction. Decentralised – isn't just blockchain. Decentralized is the flow of power and rights and, and how that it flows like blood cells flow through a body. That's decentralized. But there needs to be a body for that to flow. <laughs> blood doesn't just kind of coagulate in spontaneous pieces. Maybe it does in a movie, but it doesn't in a body. I mean, you, you have the two and there's sometimes a conflation or confusion, rather, between the two. You cater as an architecture, as an infrastructure, as an idea, will present things that start or appear to start from a centralised premise. Thanks. I think, so, okay. Yeah, yeah. Because people point. don't understand Eucadia yet, Frank. Like, I think that's the solution people are like, they don't have an understanding of. I think it would be great if we could, like, build understanding of, like, how, what, why, you, you know, we'll, you, so you, you've you've been working on a replacement system for the past twenty years oh. or more. Yeah. Like more. why and like what? Like how did we get there? And like like what are the as a remedy? Like you know what are the problems that it's that it's remedying? Remedying. And back to my question, like the private and yeah, the public. I'll, I think I, that is. I will answer that. I'll answer the public and the private now, and so it's cool. covered, and then talk about um, talk about the question of your case. So. The best way to understand um, the difference is, is that in, a, in, a, in, a, in ancient systems of law, so in the Forum of Rome, there was the uh, tablets of law. So this was, uh, and we believe this to be true because there were many writers and, and sketches and there was a belief that that's in fact what happened. The 12 tables of law were, were, were in the Forum and that was really to honour a tradition that went back to Greece, went back to Babylon, it went back to Nebuchadnezzar, um, this idea that uh, the law must be seen, the law must be open, the law must be understood. Must known. The reason no one is above the law is that the law is clear. There's no question. So if you think about, well, that, that sounds great, but what does it mean to me? I'm an investor, I'm a whale, I'm a technologist, I'm an investor, I'm an influencer, I could be any any role, yeah? So, well, the answer is, um, if you're any of those things or all of those things, um, you're going to come in contact with tax officers, <laughs> you're going to come in contact with regulators, you're going to come in contact with legal firms, you're going to come in contact with advisors and accountants, and you're going to come in contact with people that may weaponise some of those things to come after you, to gouge at you, to restrict you. It's inevitable. If it hasn't already happened, it's going to happen. That's what's happening. Um, so this is relevant because people, you will ask questions. Well, where should I operate from? Where is the best jurisdiction from? Where should I, what's the best legal structure? And there's any number of things. Do I set up in Wyoming? 
which is an onshore um, tax haven created by the US government for wooden ducks. Great place if you're a wooden duck to go to Wyoming, <laughs> but preferably not to uh, um, something that's set up for that purpose. There are more sophisticated and sensible structures that the system it uses itself. Why not use the systems that the system uses, I say. If they work for the system, why not use them if they're open? So we can talk about that in other, in other Q&As when we get more, more into it. But the problem with public and private is when something is private, something is secret. It means that you don't know. And it may not be seem a biggie to you today, but if you're facing at some point the question of whether you lose everything, maybe you've had this, maybe you know people have had this, then it gets pretty important to understand is there a way to win? And the short answer is, uh, under the way the system's designed, if the system wants to come after you, it comes after you. Now, that's not to say in a fatalistic way there's, there's, there's no alternative. There are, but this is not law. That's not law. That's, that's dictates. That's weaponising. That's bias. Uh, and we can talk about those things, but whenever you go into the system, and again, no offence to people who work in them, I've relatives that work in them, I've, you know, cousins, and had my, my grandfather was a was a barrister and solicitor. So it's just that we're in such a broken system when we look at the off chain world. And the fact that we don't look necessarily at some of those alternatives means that sometimes we miss the fact that there are choices that we can make. And in a digital world where we're looking to build alternatives, why would we want to repeat the same mistakes? Why would we? Why would we want to repeat the same mistakes when we're saying this is a new frontier? This is the uh, – I saw an article, a great article, the Dow Industrialization. I don't think I said it properly, but – yeah, the idea of a new industrial revolution, yeah? If that's the case, why can't we think outside that and think differently? Um, I, again, I can go through and, and give functional ways to talk about public and private and the difference between civilised law and uncivilised. We can talk about the 10 civilised principles, the 10 uncivilised, we can go through them. But again, I don't want to get into course material. That I'd just love to sort of see, it's kind of gauge where people are at. If they want to, that's cool. Um, that's really that's useful, Frank. Yeah. Um, let, yeah. Let's um, let's um, stop for a minute just to allow people to maybe have some questions mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. any feedback on that. That's cool. Yeah. Cool. Thanks for and, the um, detail overview, Frank. Uh, when I when I shared this uh, AMA announcement with peers, many of them said that they don't even have any background how law works or any any knowledge about law. So the overview definitely resonates with why uh, different, different individuals should not restrict themselves um, from developing interest in two independent domains. Like uh, the blockchain domain currently is quite uh, distinct from law. Uh, we haven't seen any amalgamation uh, within these two domains so far. And, mm. um, Thanks, Shankar. Yeah. So, uh, by the way, to clarify the way for participation, the AMA is open for e everyone to ask questions directly to Frank or Ramsey mm. by voice. And the whiteboard. <clears throat> yeah. And if, if you can't ask questions by voice, feel free to drop your questions in the whiteboard AMA text channel as Ramsey mentioned. We will go through them one by one. That's um, awesome. There's two questions actually in the whiteboard. One from Moon Rocket. Um, yep. And one from Philip. They're both really good questions. I like okay. Moon Rocket's one. I'm going to use, I'm going to go to Philip's first, um, and then to uh, Moon Rocket. The, the okay. So Philip, who is our you, core, core Rust developer, I'll share actually you, the yep. Yeah, I'll into, paste, into, paste the question thanks. into go. thank you, cool. and then I'll read it out as well. Cool. So Philip asks, as the private market community DAOs etc is creating alternatives to what nation states has put in, pl in place. Does Frank think that DAOs and decentralized solutions can replace current tools to implement contract law and, and things like public veto? Absolutely. And that also 
least um a, 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 absolutely well there's, 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 there's kind of two parts there's the, the kind of underpinning of that and then the, the question at the end so the, the question at the end is can can you can you replace that absolutely i think contract and one of the things that's a bit confusing in the community is the idea of still a smart contract, which is, in a sense, kind of um, machine intelligence kind of connected to a chain. Kind of, that's how I envisage it, as opposed to a contract that is more effective in its execution, that is, the terms being more effective. Uh, machine intelligence is part of that, but it's not the, by any stretch the whole picture. So that's a great question, and the answer is absolutely yes. But that then requires an understanding of how, of how contracts work. Um, the first challenge of a contract, and contracts is one of the central things, and again, I don't want to come across as, as overbearing. Or, I'm not all-knowing. It's just what I've learned. Um, so these are my opinions, by the way. This is, people can absolutely contribute and disagree. But what I've seen and learned is with contracts is contracts, the main failure of contracts in the current system is there is no way for people that don't have the financial resources or the leverage in the system we've been describing to essentially enforce contracts against belligerents when they go out of track. And that kind of makes contracts a, a pretty weak protection for a lot of businesses. So it means if you're a small business, you're a sole trader, if you're an individual you find time and time again, whether it be a bad insurance company, a bad utility company, a bad contractor, a bad partner, a big company that, that, that sends a, a small company broke. There's endless stories of horror stories that all relate to contracts. So the blockchain community has a unique opportunity to reinvent these things, but it's not just the technology. The technology provides a backbone but it's understanding what's missing. One of them is transparency, which seems a bit odd to uh, encryption, but it's not. I mean, the blockchain guarantees a record. So just think of it as a record. Transparency is the ability to retrieve um, and for there to be absolute certainty that every contract is recorded. That's a must. In their system, that doesn't exist. Only certain contracts are available, big contracts, big mining contracts and other things that matter. For us, you know, yes, insurance policies and other things get record numbers, but it's about that being central. So the contract exists. The second is the terms of the contract can be understood, can be seen. Yeah? And the third is that the mechanism to arbitrate, which, again, blockchain is demonstrating how consensus can work. You, one of the great innovations of blockchain that I think is missed is blockchain communities have proven something that some people thought couldn't work. You've proven that consensus is viable. It's a viable, it's a viable mechanism. It, it can and it works. So in, in um, contract, once you know the contract is recorded, it's not hidden, the terms are open, can't be hidden, and you make the arbitration an open consensus, now uh, people don't have to spend ten thousand pounds or twenty thousand dollars to to take a contractor to court to try and get you know half their deposit back. So I think that is absolutely a, a prime example and opportunity if the community can extend its knowledge of law and embrace that as a as a true alternative and start to kind of get its roots in that. And Ukada is. Is, is there to help with that? It is a collaboration thing. Absolutely. I see wins on both, on, on all sides. Um, as to whether private markets, community DAOs are creating an alternative to nations, this is a conversation I've had with Ramsey, and I, and I would say there's a danger of thinking that, that kind of organisations of various shapes and sizes are coming to kind of replace the, the status quo. I would flip it another way. Imagine the idea. So there's nothing wrong with private and there's nothing wrong with public. They, they, they coexist and they have benefits, the same as open source and proprietary software. The problem is how those things work. Imagine a world where the public infrastructure of a society, 
was decentralised within the concept, not of a DAO, but the thing we're talking about was this idea called a SANS, a Sovereign Autonomous Network um, Society, yeah, a SANS. And we've, we've gone in quite a way to define it. We could, we could certainly whack, whack up a white paper on it and share it with the community. Um, and we probably use maybe one or two. We could use, if you, if you want to, we could use a couple of these sessions to explain what a SANS is and how it would be as a, as a, as a vision. But it means that the society's infrastructure, its its records, as we spoke of, its con- not just its contracts, but its 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 tax records, its its revenue records, all the things that accounts, all the things that make a society, all the digital infrastructure would be, well, it, it'd be more than a metadata. It's it's a, a sans, a sovereign autonomous network that has all those elements in. It means that that society. If a, someone tried to take it over in a coup, if someone tried to bomb it and invade it, yeah, they could take the land for however they could take it, but they couldn't take that society. What you have, would have essentially given the world and given those that come after you is a solution to end war. Because if, if you can't take something by invading it, you can't take something by bombing it, you can't take it by cooing it, how do you take it? How do you take it? So I think the question is a good one, but I would flip the presumption that this is all leading towards replacing societies. I think one offshoot of this, and it's not saying that everyone has to be thinking in the public good, but one offshoot is in maturing this knowledge of law that you take the early connections that are starting to happen with societies and you give their people and the world a legacy that ends the very thing that no one believes can be stopped. And you leave an infrastructure that guarantees that a community thrives and continues, even if there's a, a disaster or a coup or, or anything. So it was a good question. I'm sorry it took a long time answering that question. Um, I see. It's a great, yeah. yeah. And before perhaps uh, we answer, we are, ask uh, Moon Rocket's question. I had one question which could perhaps help lead the conversation, um, which is to do with what what makes a how is a, what is a country and how is it legally established? Um, because we we hear a lot about network states and the referent the the kind of comparison to physical countries. So that's one question. And then secondly, um, could you explain about um, how our identity, you know, the documents for our identity is, is formed and created, perhaps? Um, okay. If you think that's, those are two good questions before Moon Rocket's question, then that's fine. Also, let me just say Moon Rocket's question is, what is the low, low-hanging fruit here? For edgeware and kabocha, in your opinion, Frank, something that we can do straight away or avoid. Thanks for the intro. Look forward to your contribution. Okay. Well, well, here's here's, here's the first. Um, the first lowest hanging fruit uh, of a community. So let's let's say people recognise the value of sovereignty, and I hope people do recognise the importance of sovereign independence and the fact that you are in a position to create your own world, your own destiny, and expand that and grow that. Uh, If that's the case, then every transaction that's happening needs to have um, potentially a way of validating that it, in fact, is part of something separate to the system. Remember, I I started the conversation early in in this call and posed that question of what universe are you building in? If you haven't defined the infrastructure and, and fully defined the alternative, complete alternative structure of a of a decentralized world, and so here the question is then, um, if you recognise that identity, because it's two parts, so they're actually interconnected, <laughs> Ramsey. If you ident- see that identity in their system is one of the the, the tracks that I identify. Uh, 
sovereignty or jurisdiction in the form of the, the thing of a person, a legal person, um, then the lowest hanging fruit and the first thing I would be looking at is, is making sure your registers are connected to a structure that's already identified that and can assist you in uh, proving that members um, in the capacity of a member being a person uh, is not the same as the person in your driver's licence or the person on your tax form or the person in your um, birth certificate or the person in your passport. So what I mean by that is um, back to law again, back to courts, back to pay your tax bill or else, back to under the thumb. Uh, a, p a person is not you. A person is a, a series of attributes connected to you around your name, around your photo, around your signature, around your date of birth, around where you live, around what you do. Yeah? These are all attributes that are collected up. It's your identity. I mean, the word identity and person are synonymous. The difference is person is a legal object. It's an object. So in OOP, in object oriented programming, person is an object. It's, a, it's one of the cornerstone objects. One could argue it's almost the cornerstone object in law. And so if all your persons a, and a member of a community is a person and a contributor is a different person, think of them as different hats. There was a guy, I never remember his name, he was famous 20, 30 years ago, and he used to talk about wearing many hats. You know, he was talking about hats. Um, I'll think of his name. He's a famous uh, 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 speaker, but a uh, business speaker. But the thing is, um, we do. We wear many hats. We're, we're a father or we're a brother or we're an uncle or we're a driver in their system or we're a taxpayer in their system, a resident in their system. These are all specific identities that are connected to um, the comes to person. They are in the persons in their own sense. And when you go to court, funnily enough, it's the person that is on trial. You just rock up because you're connected. You're, you're, the, you're the guarantor. But the, the, the person that's on trial is the person, not you. You're just there to pay the bill or, or um, stay in storage as collateral if something's going really, really bad. So, um, yeah, the answer is I would look seriously at making sure that every transaction that happens in that community is connected to a true person. Um, is, and a true person is a, a structure that Katie has spent a long time identifying as a complete separate alternate jurisdiction. It can be proven that a true person is not a, a legal person in a Roman system. It has an entirely different generation, an entirely different jurisdiction, an entirely different provenance. And I would make absolutely certain that um, my transactions, as early as I could, can be proven as being separate. Um, now, that's a good third of the way be to becoming sovereign, believe it or not. The, the rest is knowing what you're doing and argument and detail, but that's a, that's a big chunk. So I'd say for Moon Rocket, that would be the first thing I'd be trying to do. True persons, true, true trusts, and understand what, it, what those things mean in practice to proving a separate jurisdiction. Uh, you can't build them on your own. They're not things you can go and say, oh, well, we can you know, build a true person. Or, it doesn't work that way. It's a, it's a provenance. Think of it as, um, I think, a comparison I could use. Um, it is a question of provenance. It, if, if the provenance of what you claim defaults back into the system, then it means nothing. It falls back into the system. But if the provenance of what you claim is part of an entirely different system, then you now have an argument. You have a, a point of separation. And that is the beginning of sovereignty. Sovereignty begins with a separation. That's what it is. At some point, people say enough and start to identify themselves separate to the, the thing that they were part of. In this case, in the digital world, person is the first thing that you need to get separated. So uh, hopefully that answers that question for Moonwalker. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Frank. Um, it, could you define provenance? And I have a, there's a question after, after that. Um, provenance is a fancy word for um, chain of proof. 
we did, that's a I'm, just, I'm, I'm assuming trying to prove is a cool term for blockchain. Yeah, pretty snazzy. Yeah, or, so, or, bl- um, or blockchain, or use blockchain if you want to use blockchain. But so you bring is, up yeah. so you bring up like sovereignty, and mm. so one example that we can like refer to. I mean, perhaps a bunch of people um, uh, would know this reference is about Britney Spears. Britney Spears is like. Um, she's under she had a conservator her her father mm-hmm. had complete basically control over her name and she had yep. no essentially she had no right she had no no legal right no she lost she lost control of her person she lost control of her person and so how does mm-hmm. that work and is that a sort of opposition is that opposite of sovereignty uh, yeah pretty much complete yeah we well, don't have sovereignty even if you're free to drive and free to travel and, and free to spend and free to have a bank account, um, there are limits. In almost all cases, those rights are whittled down to privileges. Licenses, for example. Licenses is, is, is permission to do something that would otherwise be unlawful. That's the legal definition of a license, yeah? So right. take away the license, uh, you're a criminal, yeah? So it's, it's a kind of inverse. They've kind of taken it to the complete inverse. Um, so if you, and they've done that to make it easier to 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 enforce the law, yeah. So and that and that brings that raises like the idea, um, the concept of trusts, and how the Britney Spears, how our our person is associated to a trust, and the question is who, what what role, what role do we play in 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 what trust? So, well, they, and, so well, from what yeah, I learned from yeah. you since uh, for at least almost a decade is that um, the default position for us when we are born into uh, the system with our birth certificate uh, is an incorporation between our parents and the state of a trust that is made in our name um, cool. called a Sister KV trust. And that trust is essentially where we function uh, where we we're in a basically a very weak position you know and we do, we want to be in a position of strength right it, when we are any at any moment of which we uh, when we're operating in life we want to be in the in the strongest possible position that's putting yeah. put us in a weak position um and it's created a trust in a certain jurisdiction where we where where basically our matters are handled for us sort of like britney spears um, where Britney Spears is the infant of her father, mm. uh, and, and in the same extension, we are born as a sort of citizen. But as a citizen, which sounds nice, but in the way they've designed it, we are essentially a child of the state, and all the kind of terminology around that is prevalent when you start to realise that. For example, in the United Kingdom. Well, it's, all, it's, it's, yeah, it's all in the statutes. I mean, it's actually in there. I mean, in, but they've tied the it United down Kingdom, now. But we live yeah, in, yeah. So you, yeah, we live in um, you know, in, yeah. from the 1800s, they brought council, but they turned borough, boroughs into councils and wards. And a ward is essentially a hospital terminology, which... Um, mental hospital. A mental hospital terminology, where essentially we are treated as idiots, insane infants mm-hmm. uh incompetence and therefore we just like britney spears she was defined as an uh, idiot essentially and incompetent and uh, uh um what's the word you know like she can't handle her, her own matters essentially so her father can handle everything and in the same extension we are defined in that way um from birth and so, yeah, I'll, let me cover that because it's, it's a lot. It's a, it's a heavy subject, Ramsey, and I sort of I mean, I'll cover it. It's, it's interesting, interesting, but I, it, it, you're stepping into the origin of banking, and you're stepping into what is money. And again, I, in my first kind of intro to people, I didn't want to come across as this, this guy that's going, "What's money?" You know, because what's blockchain? Think, what's crypto? Right? What is money? Yeah, what, what is what money? Is I money? think that's great. What is money? Yeah, I mean. It, well, um, it, it's wars have been fought over it. Um, people have been silenced for it. People have gone to prison for it. Uh, they don't take it lightly. They might look a bit dysfunctional at the moment, but they're only doing that to learn. The only reason things are a bit softy, softy at the moment is the system's learning. Once it's 
think of it like a Star Trek movie or a great kind of science fiction movie. Once it absorbs the knowledge, guys, the fangs come back out again. Yeah, that I can show you the history. It's to a T. That's what's going to happen. If I've you got a lot of people commenting here saying it's really that's really interesting to understand yeah. that process of how they establish, how they design the system. That is that whether intentional well, or not intentional. Yeah, well, totally how, intentional. How, totally that, intentional. how that system yeah. is there to essentially give more power to the state and disempower the individuals that are participants in that state. Well, it, it gets down to, and again, t- today is an intro, and I don't mind if the first, if, as we do more, I hope if, people, if people want me to do more, I'll do more. I'm open for that. I'm here to, here to help and share, and, um, that we kind of find our way in the things that uh, people want to learn about, you know what I mean? And we trigger it from that way and we build from that. So what is money and what is banking? They're kind of two pretty fundamental things that you want to get your head around if you're building blockchain and, <laughs> and crypto, I think at some point, because, you know, that's what people think they're building, you know, it's a form of money and they're exchanging and, and whatever. But um, the two are interconnected, obviously banking and money, money changes. It's in the Bible. It's in lots of books and texts. It's about the whole idea of money exchange and what's going on. But let's, let's bring it back to kind of um, where it all, all started. Um, different forms of money, but what, what, what essentially makes money powerful? Now, in communities now, I'm sure there's the confidence, the idea or understanding that confidence is a key part of what makes money work. Yeah? yeah. And even to the point that people are saying, I don't want to repeat or us to be part of that status quo or that old system that really some people come to it and say, I get what money is. It's a means of exchange. It's a unit of account. Um, it's a store of value. Yeah, it's a passport to other communities. You know, these kind of basic premises of what money is, you know, tick, tick, tick. And none of them need to, in one sense, in any, any sense really, in any sense, to rational people have any connection to the history of what money was and its fundamental religious nature. You say money is a religious object and, and I'm sure rational people in many ways would go, oh, what are you talking about? That's got nothing to do with us. We, 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 we've proven that it's got nothing to do with it. Well, then pull up a $1 bill from the United States. Pull up a, a, a £10 note from the UK. Yeah? Pull up any of the, the key currency and tell me that that's not reeking with symbolism, occult symbolism. Everyone know what I'm talking about? The $1 bill, it's out there. Flip it over. What are you looking at? Well, it's Masonic and it's tradition or whatever. No, it's, it's ecclesiastical. Money is, even today, even today, is built on these principles of ecclesiastical. So what's ecclesiastical? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's a bit like provenance. It's a fancy word for religious. <laughs> I mean, it's, it, it's more than that. It's the, it's the operational structure of how things work in a, in a, um, a government structure and a connection between religious organisations, the connection points. Where, how does the Archbishop of Canterbury, for example, work with the courts? Yeah. How does those structures intertwine? What are the links between these that you never quite see that makes the whole thing work? Why did the Queen for many, many years, and uh, this is, you know, love the Queen, but part of her role was to go in and bless the money, bless the gold bars, essentially to visit them um, under the Bank of London. What was going on there? And the Bank of London still has bars from with the swatch sticker. I hope people understand that there's still gold down in the vaults of the Bank of England with the swatch sticker still on them, right? Still down there, as they have it over in New York, yeah? So the best way to understand it is, is how do you keep everyone doing what you want them to do? and not rebelling. If you're in control, you have all the money, you're the rich families, the old families have been around for a long time, you built the system, it's your system, it's designed, you, 
you periodically turn it over and let new people rise and take people out you don't want, have a few wars here and there. But, but by and large, you've been running the show for a, a while. How do you keep people in line? And you do it by mind. You do it by ideas. You do it by concepts. So the thing with money, um, pretty obvious that money in this world is a religion. <laughs> I mean, what, why would we not acknowledge it? Why would we dance around that subject? It, it, it beggars belief. Yeah, we can call it it's an operation and, you know, people get excited about it, but talk to someone with a lot of tokens and not tell them that, that you know, I come to take your token. People in this world who worship nothing more than the more I have, the more I need, the more I need, the more I have, yeah? Now, I'm not saying that's bad. I'm not making a moral judgment on that, you know. But let's call it for what it is. It is probably the, the, the coolest and most popular god on the planet at the moment. And that Frank, you're cutting out. Structure, it is embedded. It was essentially embedded because there's only two values that essentially have underpinned money from the day of the Egyptian temples, where they used to keep a record when people come into the great temples of Thebes, Karnak. Yeah, there, yeah. huge. The, the biggest exchanges the world, some of the biggest exchanges the world have ever seen are the temples of Thebes and Karmak. You're not told that. The reason they were so built, so big, and there's so many, why do you think those, those temples had so many pillars? And, and Greece had them too. You never explained them. Why were there so many pillars? Well, a pillar was the equivalent to the old address for a banker or a trader. That was your pillar. Yeah. So you see these temples, with, particularly in Egypt, there are far too many pillars to support the infrastructure. Like engineering, it's like they've gone over the top. They say, well, it's just the Egyptians, you know, they put them every five feet in this temple. And you go, that's a bit odd. Well, that's an old exchange temple. Those pillars were where people exchanged. It would be the pillars for, for trading sheep. And what did, you, what did you get in return when you trade your sheep? You got temple tokens. Egyptians, it was paper. They, the Egyptians invented paper money. They didn't give you gold coins. They gave you basically an IOU. You got paid as you left, right, if you wanted it in, in coin. If you didn't want in coin, you could take that and treat it as good and go and buy grain. So here's five sheep. I'm going to go buy some grain or some slaves or whatever you want to buy in those days. So money has always had that ecclesiastical connection. It, it's the ultimate authority, Yeah the ultimate authority in control. And that hasn't changed. And, and frankly, it probably will never change because it's the guaranteed protection of nation states and the system that you can't have your money system taken from you. Think about it. If you lose control of your monetary system, what happens? You lose control of your economy. What if you lose control of your economy? You're not sovereign anymore. You're not a country anymore. You're someone else's country. Yeah. So ecclesiastical is important because ultimately the arguments can't be out-argued that ecclesiastical sits at the top of the pile. I'm not saying, you know, thumbs up to, you know, it all being religious, but that's just it. So keep that in mind when you're thinking of why UK did spend all that time building the infrastructure around that. It's not because we were obsessed in religion. It's because we understood it's a structure. It's an yep. infrastructure. Right, the yep. infrastructure. For a lot of so people here, Frank, mm, for mm. a lot of people here, they have no introduction to Ukadia whatsoever. They have not. They don't look at the Edgeware Channel, and they haven't. Or the origin, or the or origin of money. This we're talking about the origin of money. The origin of money, yeah? exactly, exactly. Yeah. So or what like, is money? Yeah, today. This is a super interesting um, uh, direction here, and we've got um, Zavin, which is uh, Wes, who's um, wants to go on Voice Channel and ask. Yeah. Question. Hi, Hello. Hi, Frank. How's it going? So uh, hey, well. I have a question. Yeah. So to uh, to respond to your your uh, I guess definition of money uh, being a mm -hmm. religion because um, I agree with it and mm -hmm. I I first had some time I used to do it jokingly and then I understood that isn't it more a logical uh, 
like operating way that we are being that based on your definition that persons are objects and mm -hmm. money money functionally is a tool to acquire objects it's why even at any level in courts or whenever money rules money mm -hmm. is god it, it, it's, sure. it, it's at the highest yeah like it sits over us so then mm -hmm. in that way god would sit over right so it's like okay i get it why will be mm -hmm. seen as religion okay uh that that does help too because i had a question on uh your your choice of like roman law and was wondering because I, I had thoughts of why uh, religious aspects was was part of your uh, your solution thought and it was more so um because from like the original from the, like first steps of law uh, like you go to the first sets of writing and most of those were religious books so mm -hmm. that was my thought you were reasoning with and so it was, it was curious on why uh if i understand correctly you, you have uh you have more affinity with roman law above all of them or you've you've implemented no, 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 is, is not really no, okay yeah no, okay. no, no okay. not really no it's 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 it, islamic law um uh, Eastern law, Hindu law, um, and in fact, some of the key texts of Yucadia go back to the origin of the original First Nations, five worlds for the United States and North and South America, Central America, uh, Yapa for, um, for uh, Australia, the indigenous Aborigines, um, Wyatta for the Polynesians, um, and even uh, Tara for, for Celtic, uh, the origin of the Celtic. So, no, it's 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 all of those elements, but there are pinnacles. Western, the Western civilization that we are currently talking through and working in, and people may may or may not be mostly living on this call, um, is a Christian Judeo Christian system that is centered around Western Roman law. That's that's it. So it kind of gets the, the highest prominence, but Yucada covers all of it, and it's structured for all of it. And um, it has the text to do that. So, Love and I, and I'm, yeah, I, Thank I'm you glad for you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I just, I want to add something, and I really appreciate you, the, you know, the, getting the voice question. I just want to clarify something about um, the idea of, you know, the logic of money being a god. If we were talking about an even playing field, where you knew the rules, the rules were clear, and everyone played fairly then having that type of logical conclusion and or even kind of worship would be fair. But that's not how it works. You, everyone on this call who listens to it knows that that's not how it works. Yeah? It's not fair. Oh, it's you not mean the fair designed. Part. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, yeah, it, yeah. It, not, so, not, No, no, going back to what you say, which is actually what I have for my second comment of your questions about, uh, like your comments about sovereignty. And your first thing about uh, like what is law as far as being civilized and decentralized? It, it's mm. like where? How do you view? How, what is your definition of law? Because because if you're asking, then I'll respond to, to answer your question directly. It, sure. uh, I think it, I think it's more toward. I think I've seen uh, your. I think you have it as like your second belief that uh, that you basically choose to believe whatever you want. Like you already understand that. So like from the moment I I can. I don't mean to be this crazy, but I, I could just believe in anything, any law uh, from Santa Claus to just something in real life. Like it's the mm. second step is whether or not there are enforcers, right? Like that, that's really the mm. defining moment on whether well, or not well, I agree with you. I'm if you, if you're a society, yeah, if you're a society of one um, and, and okay. So if you're a society of one, so what is a law? A law is essentially a rule that um, prohibits or, um, permits some kind of action. That's all the law is. It's pretty, really, that's all it should be called, a functional description, right? It's a, a, a law is essentially a property, if we were talking in a programming language. That's all the law is, essentially a property of something. Wait, yeah? wait, one more time? Wait, okay. one more time? So, Would you mind repeating that one more time? Yeah, a law, a law, I'm trying to do it from memory. I was kind of call it up to read it out, but this is from memory. So a, a law uh, is essentially a rule that permits um, or prohibits some kind of act. That's is that all how you is. view it? Is that how you view it? 
Well, I want to answer the thing you mentioned then. Um, no, well, it, there's a thousand definitions for law. So um, that definition was used in order to come to a some kind of baseline. Yeah. But back back to your your, your point because I think it's really important. It's a good question and it's important. Okay. okay. If if you if you're a society of one one person and you're living on an island and your best friend's called Wilson, right? <laughs> <laughs> then you can do whatever you want, right? Hopefully not kill yourself, but you can do whatever you want, right? Mm -hmm. But the moment you live with more than more than yourself in as a living being, you have to come up with some accommodation, right? You have to. You don't have to. No. You, look, if you if you want that to live and basically, no, no, right? Like, no, no, that's mm -hmm. why I feel. That, that's why I had the question about your definition of law and what you personally felt. Because it's like, no, no, I feel that way as well. It's more of an agreement of behavior. Well, that's right. Now, then, where it gets tricky is there's a tipping point where the function of agreement by consensus and by logic and by reason and by respect gets harder to maintain. I'm talking about enforcement. I'm just talking about to maintain that, right? When you're three, four, five, 12 people, you can, you can and you should, in theory, be able to pretty much cover what you're doing without having to write things down, have a big list, put it on a tablet, here's our Ten Commandments. You don't need to do that stuff. But once you start getting into numbers of a few thousand, 10,000, 15,000, a few people on, a few people off, it gets tricky. And, and part of that is to understand what are the then are all the things that go with running a society that size? Because now you're talking about logistics, you're talking about people getting sick where they're buried, talking about people being born. You say, well, yeah, we can work it out as we go. Lots and lots of people have tried to, and I and I really applaud pioneers throughout history who have really tried to prove that you can run a society, decentralized society, with a minimum set of rules. Yeah, minimum. Love it. Yeah. Um, the, the the point is. Do we approach this as an ideal or do we approach this as a practical? And I think some people may think when they look at this that I'm producing ideals. I'm not producing ideals. It started as a practical. If, if people, if there's 20 people on an island, I would say don't bother with rules. Um, just come up with an accommodation and a consensus. If you're dealing with a community of 500 people starting off on, online and you've got some idea of consensus, liquid democracy, I'd say go for it. But once you start talking about bigger numbers and bigger applications of what you're doing, you're going to come up to this challenge. And, and now you start bumping up against this thing of, well, that's your definition of law, right? Or this is my definition of law. And now you have to find a way to kind of work between the complexities that a big modern society has. So your case is not looking at this from a – kind of rose-coloured glasses of, well, you know, couldn't we all live, you know, live better? I, I, I do want to wish to see we all live better, but it's actually answers to practical questions. There are people dying. There are more people in prison in America than the rest of the world combined, bar China, except China. It used to be no one was close, but China uh, changed that with um, some of their policies. Um, what's and what's about that? Is one of the highest. Hmm? state is one of the highest. Right. Go for so, so you know, uh, again, I don't think everyone that works in that institution is evil and bad, but there's something wrong, man, when, when, when you're talking about numbers and they're trading their shares on the stock exchange and they're making a killing. There's something wrong about that, right? Yes. So, and if I understand you, you're saying that it's more of a solution related to scale. So like at a, a smaller, and that's because of your totally. ability to communicate, right? So like totally. if you able to communicate the ideas, the uh, governance, the rules, then you can get participation. Yeah, I, I understand. Yeah, makes right. sense. Yeah, so, yeah, so you, don't, you don't build a society of 5,000 people with 5,000 rules. Um, that's overkill, right? <laughs> You can if you want to, you know. Um, some people have tried that. Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> well, all right. But I, I, yeah, but look, I really appreciate you asking the questions and, and you know, you can ask me anything. It's fine. All right, then I have one last one for you.
uh, yeah, yeah. about yeah. how do you see the centralization period? And then what does it mean to you in crypto? And then what does it mean to you in a DAO? Sorry, this is three parts, but yeah. That's cool, that's cool. Well, look, decentralization, I think, is one of those words that is completely misunderstood because it's seen technically and not operationally and not, not socially. So mm -hmm. decentralize, decentralization from the kind of purest ideal of blockchain is this idea that, um, that people uh, are the power and that there's no central power structure and that people are able to, through technology, um, create power structures as needed, like liquid democracy, to accomplish the functions that a hierarchical uh, society can accomplish. That's what I believe the ideal, generally speaking, is understood to be, yeah? That's theirs. Oh. My, my understanding of decentralization is decentralization is the efficient and effective flow of rights, recognizing that individual members uh, same as the original, but the original members are the are the underpinning of society. Yeah, and that um, decentralization um, to work effectively must ensure that rights, as they move through, find their consensus and equilibrium, so that society is neither oppressive, yeah, nor fragmented and essentially chaotic. In, in where people are injured, if you like, by inference, yeah? Chaos, mm -hmm. you know, a chaotic market, people can lose, as you've just seen, people can be, you know, heavily injured in, in a chaotic market as much as if it was a controlled and oppressive. So to me, decentralization is not technical. It is the, is the effective flow of rights of a community between the structures of a community, however they're structured, recognizing that that the rights begin with individual members. They are the bedrock. That's my definition and really my hope that people come to understand um, about decentralization. Yeah? Oh, great. And because I, I think I'm not sure how many others, I know I hold that viewpoint. I felt like most of Edgeware uh, does as well. So I'm glad to hear it and uh, welcome. Thanks for stopping yeah. by. And they answer all the questions. I learned a lot. Appreciate it. No, I appreciate you asking. Thanks, Robin. And we missed the question please. asked by Frogman at the start. Oh, yeah. OK. Uh, yeah, and anyone else, um, please, if they want to speak on voice mind? or on the whiteboard AMA, mm -hmm. um, please do so. Um, Frogman's Frogman asked, what do you think about the future of blockchain, future of the blockchain? Will it ever be able, and will uh, it ever be able to replace fiat? Um, th that's an awesome question. So a couple of ways. Um, I think blockchain is early enough in its evolution to evolve into the potential of what we said about SANS and mirroring and being the digital infrastructure um, of the off-chain world and really providing that. Uh, and that includes, by default, digital currencies and fiat. So I still think we're in that, that we're in that opportunity, but I see, I see it fast closing and, and this is where I'm concerned. So I probably can like, sound like I'm hedging bets. So this is what I'd say is I'm here because I, I see the window is still there to do this, but I, I think it's closing fairly rapidly and I might be over op optimistic. My concern is and this is a, a feature of just human nature. And I, I got this from Mikada, as I mentioned earlier. One of the reasons I pulled things down is just this natural concept of orthodoxy. You know, when someone new comes on and presents a, an alternative view, there's almost a visceral, a kind of instinctive reaction. You know, stranger, 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 danger. I'd say, you know, danger, stranger. It doesn't mean that we're irrational. It's just that we, when we find something we like and when something starts working and, and we're happy with it, um, it can very quickly create its own orthodoxy. And I think you can see now already in the blockchain community, for better or worse, there is an established orthodoxy that has emerged. You know, Bitcoin's at the top, Ethereum's next, and then there's altcoins and there's an off it goes. And sorry if I'm 
misstating that, but that's from my perspective what it appears to be. And that seem, seems to be, that order is, seems to be now kind of written in tablets of stone. They could very well come from Mount Sinai from, from the way that they're accepted. Yeah? Now, the danger of that is the technical infrastructure around some of those weren't there. They're getting there, but there are questions around them, their efficiency, their, their uh, operation, um, their application. And people say, well, you know, they're, they're there. They provide kind of a, an approximate equivalent to the off-chain world. There's kind of gold, so there's Bitcoin, there's silver, so there's Ethereum. And off. But it doesn't really kind of work that way. It's not really working that way. Um, so my, my fear is that uh, orthodoxy and the fact that to the off-chain world, there's so much money still to be made in pump and dumping into blockchain, and there's so much kind of resistance to really approach these things effectively rather than placeholder them, that um, even in the next year, I think you'll see the answer potentially that it, it goes the way that the solution will be another movement that takes the technology and essentially reinvents it in another way to kind of start this. And that may be the only way that blockchain evolves. And it will. It's not a question of the technology is not going away, but I don't think this existing infrastructure, I'm with two minds. But, you know, the good thing about talking about it is the people you talk to and that connect to and understand it um, are portable. They're not chained to, to pieces of technology. They may see the opportunity in the future and see it. But I, I'm, I'm positive at the moment. I see a lot of good things, but I also see a lot of uh, placeholder mindset, a lot of orthodoxy, a lot of resistance, and, and they are, uh, they're warning signs that um, blockchain in this current um, iteration may be the kind of um, net, was net space, what was it, the first one, the um, MySpace to Facebook. And people don't remember MySpace, yeah? It happened to be the big, yeah, right, okay? <laughs> and Netscape, okay. I remember Netscape. I was going all the way back. Yeah. Okay, all right, cool, yeah. So Frank um, had a kind of a question here. Um, so like the current conversation in crypto is regarding jurisdiction and regulation and, you know, where are DAOs going? You know, we're talking about these things. You know, people are talking about, you know, if I, I just shared a link there in the uh, whiteboard AMA, um, you know, and they're trying to provide a history of how corporations came to be and, you know, that, that journey to where we are now and now with DAOs and things to learn from there. You know, I, I think, you know, you've got a lot to add. You've got a lot um, uh, of insight to provide there in terms of the history and, and, and things like that. And so there's, there's these ideas that, which I'm sure you um, um, ha have seen, is this idea of the network state and creating this, um, these, these new sort of digital countries for people to be able to start functioning in, you know, to start making DAOs in, like, you know, the, the new form of corporation in these network states. How, what will it take, essentially, to have these network states be as influential as nation states, but also as um, have a sort of physical value and a physical presence? And uh, so what I mean by that is not just in the cloud where, um, you know, you, you have a sort of username and you have your funds there and then you have this other identity in the real world where, you know, and, you've, and you're trying to design, you know, try, you're, tr you're try kind of jumping between the two. It's mm. a sort of, you know, you, you mentioned before in terms of um, in a different conversation about a pirate. It's sort of like the history of how the how merchant pirates came about. And so, mm. like, how can we develop this discussion that we currently have in crypto? And that's the question there. And just to 
preface, preface that with what you mentioned in the previous answer. Yes, like the general idea, the general kind of uh, the general values and behavior in crypto is still that of Wall Street without regulation. So it's like Wall Street plus Las Vegas on steroids, essentially. No regulation. Let's just create these. On a, on a Saturday night. On a Saturday night, you know. You, <laughs> on a Sunday morning. Day, you yeah. know, on a hangover. Yeah. And like, you know, and but without, even without less, reg, with less regulation than in Wall Street. And so, uh, but with this decentralized technology to make it, <laughs> to make it a-okay. A so like, but you know, that's the, that that is going on, but of course, you know, we're here in in Edgeware talking sure. about these things. Like, you know, we're here. Like, you know, we're 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 go, we're a, aiming to influence the trajectory here, and um, and, and of course, you know, Kabocho being launched as a parachain as of basically today is congratulations, you know, by the way, great. for that. Yeah, congratulations. congratulations. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Edgeware is now successively given birth to another chain, which is a new thing. So we're trying to do new things here. We're trying to have open discussion, and mm. and you know you know but birth new paradigms and in order to do that you know we have uh we have to have an open platform we have to develop our discourse and we have to you know do things like that and this is what we're doing and so i think i, I think we're so, the, so we yeah it's a question it's a kind of fork in the road so i, I would do it this way um and i interrupted but yeah i sort of have it this way it, there's a a path that you can take which is to be a pirate but if you want to be a pirate, be a better pirate, yeah? And I'm approaching this in a, a non-kind of, you know, ethical just understanding. But if you want to build something that lasts, um, a pirate is only as good as his, alliance, his or her alliances and in, in the world of piracy, very few pirates survive. That's, that's why it's invented, you know? It was a tool... For, for, for countries, you know, privateers, um, Captain Morgan, you know, he was a privateer. All these characters that you've seen, the Pirates of the Caribbean, most of them were privateers. That is, they were licensed pirates by governments, mainly the, the government of England at the time. Or if you want to have any longevity and you're seeing the signs, which seem a bit odd in the midst of Ukraine war and other wars, but in fact the war, the world is 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 moving into a new conservatism, whether we realise it or not. That that is where we're heading. That's the the. It may seem antithetical to what we're seeing at the moment, but that's essentially the signs are telling you that that is what's coming on many many fronts. Um, whether it be the oppressive model, the Chinese model, or whether it be a more open system. The blockchain has a has a as an opportunity, but at the moment it's kind of as young things do, trying to have its cake and eat it, and go out and party, and and kind of move through. And I get that. What a fantastic trip to be on! I was too busy, you know, right right back to the law, you know, when people came to me and said, "Would you know, we'll donate some uh, some uh, tokens?" I said, "I've." Oh, don't know, just nice, that's sort of, you know, Bitcoin, whatever. Um, anyway, that was that's, that's my, my story. But as far as this choice at the moment, the only way that DAOs, SOWs will evolve into dogs, will evolve into something of substance, of a physical presence, is to recognise that you have to have an ethical basis. You have to. And people say, why? Why do we need a moral fabric? And it comes back to an even simpler definition of law. All law, all true law is moral. Full stop. That's what a law is. A law is immoral. My definition was to, to do, to be permitted to do or, or not to do an, an, an act. That's about as simple as a moral as you can get. What is not a law is something at something that is immoral. So, a DAO, a sow, a, 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 something wanting to be present has to be a SAN, a sovereign autonomous network. And to be sovereign, you have to have your own laws, and those laws must be moral. And if your laws are not reflected in the ethos of your community, 
That is, if the morals are not embedded in your culture, in your DNA, then they're meaningless. You can never be sovereign. I'm sorry, whacking sovereign on your website will never get you there. You're already in their system by default. No one's invented that I can see, you know, if you don't like your cater, come and help me fix it. That's what I've always said to people. <laughs> you know, there's no alternative. Um, there's no replacement. There's no alternative. So um, that is the answer. DAOs have to adopt ethics because ethics, morals, is law. That's what law is. That's what it is. And, and unfortunately what I see at the moment is a distinct, almost like a kind of a aversion to morals. <laughs> sort of, you know, kryptonite, you know, we don't want morals, you know, we, we, we're, yes. we're not that, right? It seems like, mm -hmm. Frank, that there's, uh, you know, inter the advancement of technology um, is out, out running the, the, uh, the ethical framework. Um, and I've, I've read that in, in uh, me um, people who are talking about medicine, how the advancement of uh, and change and advancement in med medicine has you know, ethics can't catch up, and as well in in different uh, categories of industry and society um, mm. and law itself. How can um, we? Um, I guess this is a whole seminar question, anyway. So, like, sure. coming back to kind of why we're here right now, this is like this is a pre, this is a rehearsal slash getting to know you and having sure. an AMA. But also at the same time, we're trying to get into the groove of things and develop um, um, our develop the law decoded um, seminars so that we can have a bit more structure in like um, you know so that we can develop a structure in 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 learning about certain um, important questions and like we've been mm. firing different questions around sure. here, which is really interesting. It's 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 allowed us to get some uh, uh, get our group get the groove on a little bit there. So, um, um, uh, I, I, let's. I, I want you to. I guess we shouldn't like dismiss how important ethics are in in the systems we're building and the values of of what well, we're doing. People need, yeah, people need to understand that all law, all sovereign law, true sovereign law, is moral. It, it, you need to understand that's that's a, that's a sentence that's a you know clause and immoral acts immoral and repugnant acts can never be law so you can't force a community into making that decision but they can't think that we can be the wild west that we can label things sovereign and we're all hunky dory and we'll get through this and we'll just kind of skim through it's it won't work and in fact, it, it, you just set yourself up as the as the Christmas turkey. Maybe not this year, but next year. Maybe they got you out the back, seeing you plump up a bit. Um, so how do we avoid being the Christmas turkey? In terms of by what you mean by Christmas turkey is um, getting cooked and um, mm. Um, mm. Ca captured by the current jurisdictions and the current kind mm. of uh, uh, sniffer dogs of like the current jurisdiction, like the chief regulators of. Of, of the world, uh, the, the, the SEC and things like that. Like sure. how do we structure ourselves so that we can create, as you say, SALs, sovereign DAOs, so that we can um, um, create these trusts. I'm kind of leading the question here, but yeah, how can we do that? Well, I, I, and again, we can talk the steps in more because there's more to them. I don't, I, I, tonight, or tomorrow time, but today, I don't want anyone to feel that this is kind of, as deep as it goes, on all these things, we've got diagrams and sessions and detail and explanation and examples and all kinds of stuff, which is really rich and in-depth if that's what people want. But I want it to be relevant to what the community wants to see as relevant. You know what I mean? I don't want it to come in and say, this is what I think you want. I want it to be as, as, as exciting as, and as enriching to whomever listens to this series, yeah? And that was my kind of offering to it. Um, yeah, I think that's part I, I think of the dialectic. Comes, it is a dialectic, and I think the, the answer is people have to make the decision. Are we serious or not? And I'd be objective about it. Are you, are you too attracted to 
Look, addiction is addiction, whether you're addicted. I'm addicted to chocolate, you know what I mean? Addiction, <laughs> addiction is addiction. Um, and if you're addicted to the Wild West nature of blockchain and you're loving it and you're making it and you, you, you're playing in it and it's exciting, um, be honest. If, if, if you're addicted to that, then you can say all what you want. You, you don't want to change. Then you won't change. That community won't change. It'll just go through the motions, a bit like clean up your bedroom, right? Clean up. That's what it is. It's if we're talking to this being teenage, then what we're talking about in one sense is collectively clean up your bedroom, right? And some people want to, and and probably possibly a majority won't, don't want to, and that's that's the challenge that you've got, yeah. Yeah. Is that people are still having too much fun taking the car out for a spin, yeah? Not realising that the day will come where not only will you lose the keys, but they'll crush it. Right? And if you don't believe me, then just read some history. Just just go and look at, 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 at history, yeah? It's not, it, you know, they don't... They have these signs up and these warnings. They give you these warnings. And then people go, yeah, whatever, whatever. And it, it's what they do. The only reason it seems a bit kind of cagey at the moment is they're learning. The reason they haven't launched their own digital currencies is they're still learning. And who are they learning from? They're learning from, from blockchain communities. They're learning from all the – seeing all the pluses and minuses. Um, a, a day will come where someone will say, right, time out. We've got what we need. Start, start the crusher, right? And off it will go. One DAO after another, one meta DAO after another. Bong, 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 bong. Because I don't see the willpower yet as a group collectively that really wants to stop taking the carrot for a spin, playing roulette. It's too much fun. It's, it, and I get it. I really get it now. Uh, I'm not jealous, you know. I just I went and did my own thing. Um, people made billions. I went off and, you know, ate lots of chocolate and wrote Eucadia. Um, It's just one's healthier. I don't know which one's healthier. I, don't, I, I still don't know, but I, I know eating lots of chocolate's not that good. Um, yeah, I don't think there's the willpower there, what I see. Maybe there is. Maybe some communities can lead the, the way with that. Maybe thought leaders can say, you know what, we can do this and we need to do this because in the long term, it's a smarter wealth strategy. The smarter wealth strategy being around tomorrow than being around for five minutes, kind of. I think, really, you know. I, I would say if you uh, feel that way, uh, come to Edge where see if you can fix it. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. same idea for you, Katie. Let's go. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Well, this, look, there's there's win wins all around. I mean, you, Katie doesn't doesn't. You know, part is I'm at the point, um, and you've built ideas around this. I'm at the point where I kind of step back as the kind of curator, and and you create a decentralized model. You know, I've got bits to finish, things to do, but it, it, it at the end of the day, it's it's there to be used and utilized and and grown and applied. It's not there as a museum. You know what I mean? So that's why we're talking. Uh, there was there's no more. Sorry, mm. sorry, Chanka. Sorry, carry on. Speaking hmm. about learning, we had a question from Bergs. What is yep. the biggest regret you have from Eukadia that Kabocha can learn from? The biggest secret. Biggest regret. Our biggest regret. Um, I think the biggest regret is um, battling with ego over the, the three to four decades in dealing with people and not appreciating that, that the dynamic um, that's my biggest regret is not that p people um, threw stuff at me, but I threw stuff back, to be fair, because that even if people are personal, it's not personal. It's just how we argue. As I said, if you don't know how to argue, if you don't know about dialectics and Socratic method of questioning and, 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 and logic, if you haven't applied these things, you weren't taught these things at school, or university, uh, they definitely don't taught, teach them at school, then you might simply default into Abba Holman where you, you, you say, you know, you've got a big head, you, you're 
a moron, you're an idiot, you're a crackpot, right? And, and really what you're trying to say is I don't agree with their idea, but you don't know how to do it. That's my biggest regret. My biggest regret is saying things to people over the years that I couldn't take back once you said it. Um, I think that's, that's my thing. I don't think it would have got me here quicker. I wouldn't have got here any faster, but I would have liked to have, um, you know, not – but that's my journey. That's my journey with my ego, yeah, in all fairness. Yeah. Yes. We've all we've all had a fair share of flame wars. Well, you know, you know, if you if you if you kind of walking on the edge there, and you know, over one side is massage syndrome, and the other side is, you know, <laughs> abtech property. You know, sometimes you you veer one or you veer the other, and it's and it's. Um, but that's the wild ride. It, you know, we don't have, you know, no one no one has a a. a a contract on Eucadia, you know? It's not owned by some grand whale or some organisation or anything. It's it's an yeah. open source. It truly really is. Yeah. This, has been, this has been a great initial discussion, Frank. This, we're coming up to an hour and 50 minutes, and I'm conscious sure. that it's very late for you and all the other guys in Australia. Um, do you want to talk? Should we, like, cap it off on the hour? Ten more minutes? Yeah, 10, 10 15. Is, I'm cool with that, and then we'll wrap it up. I mean... But, you know, if people have questions, I'll go for it. Far away. Okay. Okay. Um, J- I do James. Have follow up questions. Okay. Follow so, up questions. Uh, throughout the discussion, we hear a lot of emphasis on trust and sovereign laws. So, will DAO need conventional type of laws after a certain threshold of decentralization is achieved, uh, not just across that DAO? But across the whole crypto space in future, or um, is there a potential for DAOs to come up with their own laws or framework collectively? Shouldn't it be a trustless process rather than having the trust in the equation? Okay, cool. That's a good question. That's a fair question. So, a couple of things in, into it. I said earlier, the needs. In any development of law and and systems, there needs to be a clear distinction between the architecture of the system and the function of the system. I come back to the idea of decentralization. I use the idea of a body as a way to describe decentralization of rights as the flow of blood cells through the body. And I felt that was a good analogy because they're essentially without the decentralized flow of blood, um, our body would die. But there's no denying that the universe, the constraints of that, the boundary of that, which is not a centralised but a unique, uh, a one, uh, so uh, the most centralised thing you can have is the body. Yeah? So I think if, if discussions and development get stuck on this principle all the time, you'll find that people are butting heads on essentially applying the wrong principles. So an architecture, one could call it the kind of rule set, you know, the basic premise. When we write code, when code is written, we use a language, yeah? With that language, you can write a whole lot of things. So some languages will restrict you, some won't, some have features, some have bugs and whatever. But the language essentially um, provides a bedrock framework, yeah? It's centralised. It is. It's a compiler, it's an interpreter, it's an assembler. Um, it provides those constraints. So I think um, the answer is yes. A DAO not only can write its laws, but ultimately it should write its laws. People don't take ownership. Remember I said before about the willpower to change, the willpower to kind of commit to what's necessary? Well, one of the things of willpower is ownership, is passion, is a sense that you have participated in that, that you it's one of the great strengths, great potential strengths of decentralized communities. But you have to start with a framework. So, you know, a, some, what's happening sometimes is a placeholder is being presented as a framework when it's not, it's a placeholder, yeah? It's a thought, it's a thought bubble, it's a theme. Again, it's not a, it does come across as a criticism, it's not a criticism, it's just, calling things what they are. A framework is more detailed. It gives structure. That's why I say language. It gives you objects and methods and 
constructs and structures for better or worse. And I think when we talk about um, law, I'm very much of the mind that the, the, the solution that you almost kind of stepping into is to reconsider Web 3.0 as Web 3S and to almost envisage that what we're talking about is a, is a framework and infrastructure within the fabric, the DNA of, of viewing this, that then can be utilised at a dog, at a, a, a DAO, at a MetaDAO, or these new paradigms like SANS and things you've heard me mention just briefly tonight and you've heard in, in other places, um, where that can then be applied. So, again, that's a, a difference of delivery to the theory. There needs to be a theoretical frame. Like, if, if this is a living white paper of digital conversations and, and, and uh, explanation, then that's fine. You know, it doesn't have to be that formalised. It can start helping in laying it out. But I think the solution might be that it's applied within a framework and for better or worse, I think, you know, Web 3S is a good way of kind of describing it. Yeah, or 3.1 if you want to get, you know, another way of doing it. So these are my thoughts. I hope that – did 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 answer that? Did I answer your question? Yes, yes. Um, talking yeah, about reconsideration you mentioned, if yeah. the current state of – crypto is the first iteration uh, how do you envision the next iteration possibly could achieve decentralization similar to the scale of bitcoin or ethereum and if not isn't that a step back and somewhat similar to the current state of governments across the world yeah i don't i don't think the second iteration it, 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 uh, diminishes it i think it 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 puts it, you know, to use a thing we said before, it puts it on steroids, it turbocharges it. Because I think the the next iteration is to address some of the the buggy things with the technology in, in reimagining the, the, the blockchain from a from a Byzantine fault tolerance and getting down to things like OS type applications of it. Um, definitely looking at the language side of it. Um, so I think those are things, if they are elements um, well, I'm kind of cheating a bit because I have actually thought through some of these things. <laughs> there are papers and things on this. It's not it's not strictly just thoughts popping out of my head. Um, the I think the next iteration um, only works if it addresses the constraints that apply not just to blockchain but to the entire digital verse. Because I think part of answering this question, it, there's almost a kind of defensiveness in the in the, the describing of blockchain, almost to the to the exclusion of other things. At the end of the day, it is a tool, but what it allows you to do and what you've experienced is more than that. It's about formalising that and fresh fleshing it out into a structure. I think the next iteration is Web three S. Um, I think a big chunk of the community uh, will see that, and thought leaders, I hope, who have already pioneered into Web3 will, will then be pioneers into Web3S, Web3.1, will recognise this, recognise it's easier to evolve, as they've already proven, but look to fund those infrastructure um, uh, bottlenecks that are holding things back. Bridges are a good example, right? from what I understand, are a good example that need to be reinvented in the way they apply, both from a, a, a reducing the, the, the vector attack um, space, but it definitely needs to be. As I said, operating system definitely need to look at the way that the technology is applied and whether it can be embedded further down. There's a whole lot of things that, that can supercharge this to achieve what we said about a network state the sands we speak of. And it, I don't believe in any stretch that the existing infrastructure model of Web 3.0 can handle that. I don't believe that. So either it's evolved within it, which is less likely, then it evolves in the next iteration, which is much, much more likely. Um, so that's my feeling. 
Um, I might be wrong, but that's my feeling. Does that okay. answer yes. that? Yep. Yeah. Can cool. you explain why you feel that it won't evolve within? Sorry. Oh, um, <laughs> we've kind of covered it. It's 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 essentially a dynamic of um, of social growth. It's not it's not a it's not a in by any stretch a opinion or um, impression of the leadership of the blockchain community. So it's it's not in any way a comment on communities or a comment on the leaders. It's simply a, a, a function of society, and it is that when societies form around uh, singular or simple concepts, they achieve orthodoxy much faster than broader church, broader communities with a broader set of – because they, they're able to apply themselves quicker, but in the process they develop this inability to evolve, which we call orthodoxy, that is the resistance to change. Um, where ideas become less and less accepted, status quo becomes more and more accepted, uh, and once you do that, it, it, it's it's almost impossible to develop uh, at the rate of adaption that we're seeing in the world and technology itself. That's what I fear. Uh, I'll give you an example. We talk of so we you know I'm talking about blockchain. I'm saying using the word we. Here we go. Uh, um, I've heard this concept, Bitcoin maximalism. Yes? The concept Bitcoin maximalism mm -hmm. as an example. Yeah? And, and this is now accepted as a feature, that it, it exists and there's many examples of it. And there are many proponents of it. Yeah? Mm -hmm. that's, or, that's orthodoxy. What's that saying to you is that decisions have been made, concrete has been poured, rebars have been laid and that is not going to be dug up and those principles are not going to change in the current iteration of blockchain they're not going to change yeah i gave you another one tonight a lot of people just enjoy the nature of blockchain the way it's currently structured they get a thrill out of it it's a buzz it goes up it goes down they make a lot that sometimes they lose it's 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 a game these are features that are now embedded in this current iteration of blockchain, for better or worse. Um, and so, like MySpace and like Facebook will become, or Meta or whatever it is, iterations will, you know, demand and necessity, um, vision and reality are all going to, in a sense, conspire to do this, whether, whether we like it or not. The question is, are we part of that dialogue? And are the thought leaders today um, part of that dialogue or are they placeholding to kind of patch things? Yeah? And um, I'm not making no judgment. People, are people. it's amazing what's being created. Um, that's what I'm saying. I, I see it. I gave you a, a kind of 50-50 answer, but that's why I'm seeing that what, I've, what I think is going to happen in the next 12 months is that I don't see the current iteration um, being the place that Web 3S is going to evolve necessarily. I think groups can migrate. I think there'll be pioneering groups that will make the change. Mm -hmm. um, but I think a large part will just happily stay where they are. Yep. And Frank, what are the benefits of being having this, having blockchain uh, infrastructure, but with a sovereign framework, like uh, in comparison to communities that are just kind of forming uh, altcoins and not being very clear like not not being explicit about what they're doing what's the benefit of of, of being a sovereign dao rather than just a dao well um let, let's go through it again if if your god is money it means your money is going to be around for a long long time that's one isn't it you may not have the thrill of the the chase of it going up 50% and down 30% and up 80%. But it means that, that what you've invested in becomes part of the infrastructure of the future. It means that sovereign networks um, are become an essential part of the fabric of human civilization. It means that DAOs and networks become a, a part of that. It means 
you are leading um, the world beyond just simply the, the, the function of the, of the technology. You're, ex- you're using it to expand it to other, to other spheres. Um, yeah, as I said, you may, you, may not, you, you may lose the kind of Saturday Night Thrill of just pulling it all on red or black, but yep. um, you're going to have it. You, whatever you invest in now, you're going to have in 10 years' time. That's the difference. Does the sovereignty yeah. part add the layer, like can, uh, add the physical layer as well as, uh, as well as just having a digital layer? As a DAO, I'm sure it's just like digital, um, a sort of digital, uh, you're on a digital space, which can be defined, doesn't have to be defined. It's up to you as a community. Okay. But then well, let's, yeah, let's, to do. what about, you know, as a, so- as a sovereign DAO, isn't one of the benefits um, that you can own physical assets, like have own right. land? So, uh, like totally, that. totally. So the, the, another way of saying it, if we, and again, this is my first time to talk and yes. hear from you, and I really appreciate everyone that's interacted and asked questions. Um, let me put it even in a simpler way. If you're not a sovereign DAO, a part of a true sovereign system, and there'll be choices in this. One will be that the existing system will learn and develop that technology, however they do it, whenever they do it, or the Ucadia, yeah? And assisting, helping that. And I mean that not saying, well, take a lump it, I'm just saying I've spent more than three decades on this to build the elements to make that help, to understand that. If you're not going down that path, then essentially you are playing in a sandbox owned by the existing system, to use a computer analogy again. You are in that sandbox. At some point, that sandbox is going to be turned off. That's the choice you have. And I get it. If you want to just keep putting it all on red, put it on red and and see what happens. Um, That's what I said, that, that honest conversation has to happen in communities to, to understand where they sit. Some will do, um, some, some won't. I don't know how many, and some leaders will, some leaders won't. Um, it, the only future, ultimately, is accepting that change is inevitable, innovation is inevitable, um, this is not going away as a technology, and it's either going to be embedded in these sovereign structures or or it's a sandbox that's opened up for, for a while and goes. What showed up for me there was the idea of pirate life or sovereign life. Uh, pirate life being the dark web, sovereign life being something, something equivalent to a country with clear, you know, with, with trust and clear laws. And currently we're in the middle of the road. Where we're a little bit pirate and we're a little yeah. bit trying to be sovereign, you know, Edgeware, you know, we, we have, in te- there's many communities around Edgeware as, as well that are uh, working on uh, aiming to be, to have these jurisdictions and to, you know, we call ourselves Edge, edge citizens and mm-hmm. things like that. And so I'm guessing that the, we have this opportunity right now being in the middle of the road, but that, that, uh, that will eventually uh, time out. And that if you get caught in the middle of the road, as I've learned from you, then you're going to get run over, essentially. So, so we, call, like, we, call, we, we call it roadkill in Australia, yeah. Roadkill. Yeah. So roadkill, like how yeah. Do yeah. Roadkill, either we go, work at, go be anonymous in the dark web or grow up, essentially. Yeah, and I, and I don't want people to feel that, that it's, um, like I said, and I, I've used comments tonight not to in any way be condescending. I've just used it to kind of put it in, in real terms. I don't want people to see this as a discussion on clean up your room. Yeah, it's it, think of it as as a value judgment. Either become better pirates, and there's a, a life in that, right? The life of the pirate. Be but be really good at it, or um, accept that you have to have a moral framework for any longevity, um, and go down the sovereign route. But you can't be both. Yeah, I have a, I have a question. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because uh, I, I, I mean, just to you know, debate all thoughts is just how I am. I would argue that a uh, sovereign uh, person can become a pirate and then go back because it's just a role that they're playing. 
uh, but a pirate is a pirate, so sovereignty does overrate. Uh, well, I, yeah, I think on your island with Wilson, absolutely, you can <laughs> you can you can do all those pirate tricks what you like, but you come back to the the. the, the, the you see this, and I think we've we've gone through this exploration. And, and I'm again, I'm trying not to make moral judgments tonight in these discussions because I think everyone here. Well, well comes, if I can say, if I can yeah. say one thing, before, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. Yeah, that just, yeah. Uh, that was just my quick thought on your last statement. My my, my real question to you is mm. on your perspective of DAOs and. Mm -hmm. Is it is it due to uh, your knowledge about how most uh, DAOs operate or the uh, structure of most, and or why don't you view DAOs as sovereign? What what is your differentiation between sovereignty and decentralization? All right, the, the, my perspective coming in at this, and and I'll do it this way. If I'm deep. <sighs> Most blockchain communities and most communities that are passionate and exciting about what they're doing, and you're part of that, um, naturally adopt an inward-looking focus. It's not a negative by any stretch. It, it's an interest, it's a passion, something you enjoy, right? But if you're looking inward, you're not necessarily looking outward yeah, or upward. Is that a fair starting point? Is that all right to start well, the conversation? I would say you're... Your basis is is correct, and this is my belief that you are uh, that your understanding is on because of how the majority is built, and and that's what's like yeah yeah okay all right so yeah because the belief like, yeah so yeah so so yeah, when you when you're looking at yeah because I wanted to I don't want to you know again I don't want to don't worry. speak over people yeah so that's so if that's your beginning and your beginning is that that you sort of looking inward. Um, when you look outward and you look upward, you realize that, that DAOs don't live, it's not an island. A DAO is not an island. As much as you think it is a digital space, it's not an island. It either is connected to something greater or it's not. And if it's not, it defaults back into sovereign, the, the jurisdictions that it's around. My issue with, with DAOs and with MetaDAOs is that they haven't moved one or the other yet. And you heard Ramsey say it in a sense that it's that middle of the road thing and and i've said it tonight too in my way and i get it i totally get it it's fun it's exciting you want to be a little bit pirate today you want to be a little bit not mother Teresa, but you want to be a little bit you know ethical tomorrow and you want to kind of keep your your options open and that's kind of the feeling is that well why do we need to change what, what you keep saying it and i come back to it from the macro level, as big as you can go, as high as you can go, the entire blockchain community currently is operating in a sandbox, a sandbox that they don't own or control. How long that sandbox is open for, I don't know. But if you're playing that sandbox, you're playing ultimately to someone else's rules and you can't be sovereign. As much as you like to label it, you know what I mean? You can't, well, because... Because, because, because they, because ultimately they will use their jurisdictions and the fact that you haven't. The question was asked at the very beginning, and I didn't kind of get through it. But, but again, it comes back to this question of hard work and and the challenge. A sovereign society has a number of detailed elements to it that you just can't go down and buy at the local store. You can't do that. It's, it's embedded into the culture. It's part of the structure of the community. It's part of their um, ethos. It begins with the, with the narrative, the story. It's obviously the law structure, but that's not everything. It's the records, the registers, the, the identities, the legal identities, the legal objects. All these components um, create the overall structure of something that is viable. When someone goes into a court, and I've, I've seen this, I, I used to see this with people when I was talking 20 years ago and 10 years ago. They'd get a, a kind of inkling of sovereignty and they felt that all they needed was a couple of forms, a few keywords, and they could go and be Harry Potter in a courtroom. And it's not a reflection on you. I'm just saying it was a general thing, right? It's a general approach that people had. Um, sovereignty is detailed and, and they know it. They know it. And when you go in there and you say, well, I'm sovereign, and they go, well, you're sovereign of what? You're sovereign of your own tokens? We've got jurisdiction. 
You don't even own your own persons. You don't hold any property. All your stuff's through legal entities that we own. And they go on and on and on. And before you know it, in five minutes, um, you're, you know, you're sovereign of nothing left because they've taken it from you. And I'm, I'm not, again, I don't think fear is a motivator. So this is not a discussion of, of, you know, be frightened or be concerned about the future. It's just see it for what it is. You're in someone else's sandbox because the digital universe that you operate in has not yet defined itself as separate. I, I can't say it any other way. It hasn't. Oh, That's no, Web3S, it, it, yeah? Web3S. No, it, it took a mm -hmm. while for me to fully understand uh, again, and actually to remember, uh, I saw from your original uh, video, you understand words uh, from their legal standing. So when you say sovereign, or when, when you hear it, or when I say it, I, it you're, you're not, I'm saying it from a, uh, I guess, like a, a mental, um, like life uh, mm. way that I, I get function and what you're saying, no, 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 no. You're like, no, no. In order to be, so in order to be considered sovereign, well, we're talking about something different. We're saying that, yeah, you need to be defined within law because the control you're saying is in the control mm. of your chain. That, that's why I was wondering, like, what did you mean by control? You're saying because the uh, state or just wherever the dominion that you're in, that still has higher governance to you. So since you're still part of that, the, the uh, digital space itself hasn't been defined without, it hasn't been defined in general. And well, that's- I, I'll use it, yeah, I'll use, the, I'll use an image for you and and we'll kind of, we'll, and we've got time to talk about it. And all the sessions I, I, we do, however many we do, I've said to Ramsey, I want to make sure that a big chunk of it is Q&A, yeah? So we can have dialogues. And so, Everyone has a chance to talk, you know what I mean? Everyone has a chance to, to ask their questions. So I, I love the, the interaction. I, I'll leave you with this thought. What I'm trying to express here is blockchain in one sense, and again, this is just an analogy. It's not a, in any way to be derisive. It's just an analogy. At the moment, the blockchain communities, when it comes to money and banking and assets and sovereignty and community, is a bit like, a bunch of kids from the neighbourhood that have gone out the back and built a really the best fort you've ever seen. They built the best fort in the backyard a kid could ever see. Right? Two yeah. thumbs up to those kids. Yeah, two thumbs up. But it's in someone else's bloody backyard to to be a bit Australian, right? Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. And, no, and yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. okay, have we got the have we got the concept now? Right? Yeah, it's and, not Right, great, cool, all right? Yeah, and that's right, what you mean. Right. You know? Frank, that's what I mean. That's... Is there an example mm -hmm. in history? Because when you, when you gave that uh, analogy, you know, it's, it's, it's essentially we've, the bl blockchain technology has created a, a, uh, an op it, cre it created a new space for us to construct a place to play together and create the sort of value together and share value together. Um, and as you said, it's, it's possibly in someone else's backyard and it's a very, it's a strong fort. Um, and this is what led to, so, to the kind of NFTs currently being these kind of toys that have no, and people are, you know, people are questioning, well, why doesn't this, why don't people use this for something proper? The, the point is you probably can't, people are scared to use it for something proper because then it definitely goes into their backyard, right? Like right now, people are just, you know, like with CryptoPunks, you know, and it's gone up to hundreds of thousands floor price. Um, it's it's because they have nothing else. You can't really you you have to create your own toys within that realm. Um, but the question, you know, where we want to go is to uh, use the use these these new technologies and the and these new capabilities we have as uh, online communities and make them um, even more and to and to not be limited to just um, these new digital assets we create as well. So that's really cool. cool. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to, yeah, I'm happy. Right. To, thank you. Can can I, I, I'm sorry. Hey, hey, could I, could I have one last question? Cause I thought about your example and I just wanted to see well, what you would well, just say. Right. Absolutely. But I think you've remember you, you used to question credit. You're going to have to let other people ask in the future. Far away, no, far away. <laughs> no, no, it, it, it's it, it's because of your example of uh, playing in someone else's backyard. So my thought yeah. is like, okay, 
What if that uh, was spread across multiple backyards and a copy of its members were kept? Would that create decentralization? Because that is what we are in crypto. So I wanted to bring yeah. the model. Completely. Okay, okay. Well, I'll answer that. I'll answer that. I'll answer that. And I'm done. I'll answer I that. Promise. Okay, cool, cool, cool. That's cool. And again, I, as I said tonight, I said, said at the very beginning, any question anyone want to ask, I'll answer with this and I'll, I'll kind of wrap up. It's a cool idea. And I think every kid should have a, a good fort in their backyard. And if you're in the business of building good forts in, in every kid's backyard, I think that's a great idea. But, but this is where um, I want to remind you. It's still kids' forts and it's still someone else's backyard and it's backyards owned by adults. Could we just start building our own backyards, please? And then we can build forts or not build forts or build whatever, right? That's, I'm using the analogy to try and explain that, 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 that that's what we're trying to do. Eucadia has spent decades not just building backyards, but building a whole digital planet, yeah, framework. That's what we've done. It's there. It doesn't have all the bells and whistles. It's not overly sexy in the sense it hasn't gone out and marketed itself and gone to conferences and, and done that. But then again, I'm glad it hasn't because it's not about that. It's about how things work in the future and it's about how things – infrastructure is infrastructure. Infrastructure is never particularly sexy, but it kind of holds a, a community together, right? Hard to drive, hard to drive down a, a, a rocky track, you know? We, we need roads. We need whatever. So – um, I hope the analogies um, answer it, and I, and I think there are going to be lots of questions. You can ask me anything. The thing about tonight and the next sessions, Ramsey, is just getting a sense of what people want to hear, and then we'll assemble it into that. And you, it, it, I'm I'm trying to honour the ethos that you're trying to do. I'm trying to mirror that by saying you let us know the things collectively that you want to hear, and I will. And if you don't like it, we, we'll stop. But if you if you get value out of them, we'll follow through and, and do them the best I can in the time I've got. All right? Absolutely. So, so, all right. Thanks for that, Frank. Um, and so uh, given that this is sort of dynamically evolving, um, when shall we have another conversation? Where? And um, shall it be sort of another AMA like this or shall we start our seminars? With the introduction to law presentation and Q and A, and if anyone else has comments like that, um, we could we could start, but it would be interesting to see. I mean, and again, you know, some people will people have all different opinions from what they hear. It, this is recorded tonight, so people have a chance to hear the questions, hear some of the topics that were raised. Hopefully, there will be interest. I, I I would say give people a chance to kind of put their input in so it's not like those pre-recorded talent shows where they say call in to vote <laughs> and you've already seen in the ads the thing's been pre-recorded. Let's let's give people a, a little bit of time. And if we start in a couple of weeks, we start in a couple of weeks. Um, but, yeah, we'll go through and my do instinct, as much as we can. Hmm? My, my instinct is that, like, we need a language to be able to have a conversation. Like, because mm -hmm. what you're introducing and, you know, we've – because the, this AMA has been quite uh, um, open and the questions have been firing from different places, I think it's, it would be great if we could set up a sort of curriculum in a way, you know, with what you think, like, you know, um, you know, because uh, in terms of like introducing these concepts of law, which we haven't yet done. So mm -hmm. uh, it's maybe some people have not been able to fully understand the, what you're saying because the language hasn't been defined yet. And those, Okay. Well, things like things like the history and the nature of money is a good one because it's a theme of crypto. Yeah? Corporations, I think corporations. I think corporations, people, people yeah. think they know about money. So I think what's more important is like the the, the history of corporations. Okay. They, you sure. know, the different law, legal jurisdictions, how they came to be, those trusts, introduction to law, and like a sort of recap from your initial Eucadia session that has been shared mm -hmm. in the AMA. Some people have watched. Uh, a sort of recap of that because that has been that was the key really for for me to understand well, to navigate the, the your further seminars essentially. Well, I hope I hope people direct back to you and um, to the to the team, and then 
that yes. gives clarity and, and I will I'll take on on board what the direction is and I say do my best to yes, please, share with and you then, and yeah thank you sorry sorry right. to talk over you there Frank but uh, yeah that, um, please any if anyone has like feedback uh, all the feedback is super useful to to you know mold the uh, the discussion and the and the dialectic um, we got going on here and um, so f would you like to talk next week Frank or the week after and would you like it to be on Discord or would you want to do it on Zoom? Um, I didn't mind once I worked out how to use Discord. I mean, it's been fine. Um, yeah, I actually prefer Discord more than Zoom. I find for some reason Zoom is a um, – it's what people want. I mean, if, if, if more people can connect with Zoom, you, you, you let me know. Um, but, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll touch base with, the, with everyone and see what they, that they say. But I'm more than happy – um, to, to spend the time and uh, we start next week, we start next week, yeah. Sure. And the goal essentially in these seminars is not just to be internal to Edgeware but to have shareable mm. content to be exported. So this sure. is – Discord is amazing right now, so we can do another one of these, I think, to get, sure. keep – you know, to do some more um, uh, bicep curls in regard to this. <laughs> and, then, and then we can aim towards, like, making a – shareable thing so i guess we'll put in the diaries we'll pencil in the diary when we come offline um right. when the next session is i hope people have um been in ha, has a mixture of be, being very uh, helped um, spark their curiosity uh inform them and hopefully you have more questions and hopefully you can like maybe look at watch those initial seminars because they're really useful um they're in the Commonwealth link um, in the Commonwealth link uh, there called Law Decoder seminars and let's let's um, uh, keep it going basically. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, and, and all the best to everyone on the call. Okay. Thanks, guys. Okay. Thank you. See you guys. Bye bye. Thank you so bye. much. Bye. Thanks, Wes. Thanks, Wes, for contributing. Bye. 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 Thank you, Dan, for dedicating your time to the HY community. And thank you, Shane. As always, thank you to the community members who tuned in. As a thank you note, as always, all the AMA participants uh, will share a pool of 100k HVA community engagement points. So kindly DM me your AGVA address to receive your ISIPs. And this concludes the first of its kind AMA. See you everyone in the week planning call later today. Bye. Thanks, Shaka. Bye bye. Mm, bye guys. <laughs>